Binaries. What do they mean? Well, believe it or not, the answer isn't just a number. That's not only because you don't have to save numbers with them, but also because there isn't just one number for you to read. And so in this video, we'll go over a couple of different ways to read binaries, to save integers, rational numbers, and the upsides and downsides to all of them. But first, unfortunately, we have to start with the basics, and that is reducing ambiguity. This will be a trend that we will circle back on a lot of times over this series, but for now it's important because it explains why we use binary. I've already mentioned that in the previous video, but basically expressing something in terms of just 1 and 0, or true or false, or on and off, or cube and circle, is a lot more strict and specific than defining it in terms of a real number, because you have only two possibilities and everything is either this, or that. There is no 0 0.5, no kind of, no starting, and absolutely no square code! But it does have a drawback. Imagine that you have 5 apples, or 7 apples, or 21 apples. With a real number expressing all of those values, it's trivially easy. It's just a 5, or a 7, or a 21. It's simple. But if you have only a single digit that can only be a 1 or a 0, then it's a lot more tricky. That's because if you, for example, represent 5 apples with a 0 and 7 with a 1, you have nothing left for the 21. So how will we fix it? Well, we could fix it by adding more digits, of course, and there are two points I'd like you to take away from this segment. First of all, the way we read binary data is always completely arbitrary. And second, the maximum amount of data any bit of binary can represent is always constant. So for example, this number right here can mean anything depending on how you read it, but 8 digits can always represent a maximum of 256 different numbers. Why? Well, let's start the simplest way to save numbers. Integers. For that, we do it in a quite intuitive way. Right here on the left, we'll have the binary number. On the right, I'll represent the exact same integer with a decimal number. We start with 0, then a 1, then a 2, a 3, 4, 5, and so on and so forth. I won't dwell on this too much because it's the exact same way as in the decimal system. So here's numbers changing a bit slower, so you can see the similarity. I think that should be simple enough. But going back to our two points, it's important to remember that even though this way of writing numbers is intuitive, it's still completely arbitrary, meaning that if you want, you can read the numbers by having all of them be equal to even numbers. Or maybe primes, where each next one would just be index of a prime. You can see that in each of these cases, the exact same binary number refers to three very different values. So this information can be interpreted in many different ways. Or in other words, information doesn't matter, only interpretation does. Okay, so, different ways to read data. What do I mean by that? Well, let's start the simplest one, integers. You've already seen it before, but I'd like to reiterate it to contrast it with different options. So here it is, slowly ticking upwards. But that's not the only way to save integers. Most notably, this only saves the positive integers. If you want to represent negative integers as well, it's a different story, because you need something to convey the information of whenever a number is positive or negative. A simple way to do that would be to just allocate the first bit to instead of representing the number value, represent the sign. So for example, a 1 could be a positive and a 0 could be a negative. This way you can cut the magnitude of values you can represent in half, but for that you get the ability to represent negative numbers. Except there's a problem. That's because 0 and negative 0 are the same value, which means that this and this both convey the same information. Which means that even though normally we'd be able to represent 256 different values, this system can only represent 255, because we're doubling up on our information. Binary still has the maximum amount of information, not the actual amount of information, and any inefficiencies will always be able to reduce it. That's why when creating an information saving system, the first thing we'll care about is reducing inefficiencies, meaning that we want as few numbers as possible to share a single representation. Alright, what's next? Well, in order to understand that, let's talk about different numbers we could save. 
like real numbers. Real numbers are much more tricky than integers, because whilst for integers there was a finite amount of numbers in any range x to y, for real numbers there is an uncountably infinite amount of them, which is quite a few more lot. Now, how do you represent those fractions? Well, for integers you could think about the representation this way. We had our digit, and each digit represents a different 2 to the nth power, meaning that for a number like 100, for example, we have 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 which means 0 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus 1 times 4 plus 0 times 8 plus 0 times 16 plus 1 times 32 plus 1 times 64 plus 0 times 128, that's 100. And that's how we can think about integers in binary, which is important because based on this we can create a system that will also work for floating point. And a simple way to do that would be to just add negative powers. That way we could express even the floating point like so. Now instead of referring to a 100, it refers to a 3.25. This leads to an interesting phenomena where we can represent a number like 3.25 or a number like 3.3125, but a number like 3.3 is impossible to represent. This may seem odd, but it makes sense. There are certain numbers we can, and certain numbers we can't represent. And so here's where we get to the, in my opinion, neatest part of the video. And that's the visualization. So here's how we walk. Right here I'll create a dot. This dot represents a binary number. They will go higher and higher like so in the classical integer fashion. Now that's the up and down. Left and right will represent the number line. The higher the number, the more to the right, up to 10,000. The lower the number, the more to the left, up to a negative 10,000. And with that in mind, let's go over every single digit in binary and see what it looks like. Here's, for example, a 16-digit integer representation we've seen on the beginning. Now this is obviously going off the page, and if we look to the right, you can see that it continues until it stops. This isn't just me cutting the line short, by the way, it's the limit of what we can save. And even though this line may look perfectly continuous, it's actually just dots. 65,536 dots to be precise, and if we switch it from just positive integers to negative as well, then the first bit goes to represent negative numbers, and so the new lines look like this. Now it's important to realize that we get two lines, but those lines are half the length. That's because the amount of dots, that's because the amount of dots never changes. We can only move the dots around, not create them, not destroy them. And that's why, if we want to represent negative numbers, we also have to represent less of the positive numbers, because these dots have to come from somewhere. In the same manner, if we switch it from only integers to a floating point, with our method from before, if we want the fractions to be represented, we need to sacrifice something else. And that something else is the numbers on the sides. Now this may not seem like a much of a change, but if we zoom in on them very carefully, you can see that as representing fractions, is very different from us representing integers. And that will be the point of this segment of the video. I want to show you the difference between different ways to represent all the kinds of binary numbers. Now we already know one of them. And that's the 2 to the nth power, where n is offset, which means that it could go from 2 to the 0th power up to 2 to the 15th, or it could just as easily go from 2 to the negative 60th to 2 to the negative 45th. This lets us represent both integers and floating point numbers. But is there another way to represent them? Well, yeah, and that way works like this. We take our 16-digit binary number and we break it down into two 8-digit numbers. Now we just divide the left 8-digit number by the right one and we get a rational number. Here you can see the number sticking by, which should make it a bit easier to understand. So going back to our visualization, this is what it would look like for a 16-digit number that's going from negative 4th power to a 12th power, and this is what it would look like with our new system. As you can see, the distribution is completely different, and it's no longer just a simple line. Instead, it looks more like a cone. Why? Well, first, let's stretch it out. Having this line at the bottom, instead of representing negative 10,000 to a 10,000, let's have it represent from negative 500 to a 500. Great. Now we can zoom onto these dots to actually see what they mean. And so here we go. 
First, let's start by remembering what everything means. Left to right, we have what value our numbers represent, starting at zero and then going up. This is just a number, good old mathematics. Next, we'll have the binary configuration, which will be a 16-digit binary number. And up and down just means us going over these binary numbers in an integer-like fashion. So here you have these numbers slowly ticking up, and here's them ticking up faster. I do believe that it should be all clear. I do believe that it should be all clear so far. If not, I'd really recommend re-watching the video and then eventually it should click. And with that in mind, let's introduce the way we interpret these binary numbers. And the idea is simple. We take the first bit and we'll use it as a sign. So zero means positive, one means negative. Next nine digits will represent the top of our equation and the last six digits at the bottom. Meaning that as we slowly increase the binary number, this is what it will look like. There we go. Now it's time for the crucial part, the part in which we set the value equal to what we get out of our equation. Or in other words, the dots. And so that's what the dots mean. Every single new number that we can represent using this system is itself represented as a dot. And with that in mind, let's discuss the pattern. First, we have a bit of a line at the bottom. The reason why that line is there is because for the first 63 numbers, all of it is just zero divided by something, so just the zero. Then all of these dots right here are there because I defined x divided by zero as zero, okay? I, I, it had to be something I will not explain myself to. Going back to the start though, every single time the teal number jumps up, our actual number gets set to its maximum because we just divide it by one. Then as we begin increasing the bottom number, we're actually decreasing the complete value, dividing it by a higher and higher number each time, until we fill the bottom number, at which point we move it up and move our value to the right. The furthest point to the right is just the top number divided by 1. That's why for each of these dots is just the 1 at the bottom. The furthest point to the left is just the top number divided by 63. So as we keep increasing the top number, we just get 1 divided by 63, 2 divided by 63, 3 divided by 63, and so on, so forth. So each of these lines is just the top number divided by a different bottom number. And that's the pattern. Now with that in mind, if we look at this whole distribution again, we can see that this method of representing numbers gives us a much denser distribution near the lower numbers than it does near the higher numbers. You can see that near the lower numbers there are a lot of points, which actually isn't that bad. I mean, if we're representing floating point numbers, then chances are we'll probably care more about the accuracy near the smaller numbers, closer to one, rather than the bigger ones, so this isn't really that much of a downside. What is a downside, however, is the fact that we're losing a lot of information here. First of all, whenever the bottom six numbers are equal to zero, we just set all of them to zero. That's a huge waste. Whenever the top nine numbers are equal to zero, we just set all of them to zero. Huge waste. Another problem is that one divided by two is equal to two divided by four, which is equal to three divided by six, and so on, so forth. Which means that whenever we multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same number, we get a different binary. But it represents the same value. Huge waste. And so that's why in real life we don't use this system to represent the values. Instead, we use the exponents. So how would that work? Well, we divide our number into two parts, the exponent part and the non-exponent part. The red part will be a standard binary number going from 2 to the negative 1 power up to 2 to the negative 11th power. And the yellowish part will be just the binary number minus half of the maximum. Now, we just bring the red to the yellowish power and there we go. If we get back to the graph visualization, this will mean us switching from this system into this one. So let's talk about what it means this time. Well, first thing you might notice is that our numbers get really, really large really, really quickly and that's not a mistake. If you remember, the bottom number goes from 2 to the negative 1 up to 2 to the negative 11, meaning that the maximum number it can represent on its own is 0 0.999511718875. And then on the powers, these numbers go from negative 15 to a positive 16, which means that if we start with a really low number on the bottom and bring it up to a really low negative power, then we end up with a massive number. 
And that's why as we bring the bottom number higher and higher, eventually that bottom number being brought up to the negative 15th power stops mattering all that much and it gets closer and closer to 1. So the reason why all of this is divided into lines is because right here, this is a number that's really close to 1 being brought up to a negative 15th power, and this is a number that's really close to 0 being brought up to a negative 14. And yes, this number is so large that Blender actually just calls it infinity, and we need to increase it a bunch until we get an actual number. So that's what causes the jump from the value that's really close to 1 to a value that's going off screen. Then as we keep increasing and increasing our numbers, eventually we reach the power of 15 minus 15, which is why all of these numbers are 1. And then as we get positive powers, we only get numbers between 0 and 1. And oh boy, where should I start with this? This system can represent both really tiny and really massive numbers. The density is higher between 0 and 1, considering how basically half the numbers are there, and the numbers rarely repeat, other than the wasteful string of 1s. And that's why in real life, this is what we use for the actual floating point numbers. This will be especially important in the future videos, and I would love to say more. I would love to go over a bunch of different ways to save the numbers, maybe also strings, maybe colors, but unfortunately, it's been a week since I uploaded my last video, which means we unfortunately need to cut it short. But for a quick recap, the important takeaway from this video is that when it comes to reading binaries, there is no single right way to do it. Instead, it's all completely arbitrary. Some ways are better if you want it to be uniform, some ways are better if you want it to be consistent, and some ways are better if you want the density to increase and as little repetition as possible. But there is no one perfect way to do it. This will be especially important trend later on in the future episodes of this series, we'll create our own file system, which once again will be completely arbitrary. But for now, that'll be it. Now in the making of this video, I spent a lot of time making the geometry nodes and the Python scripts and Actually, that gave me an idea. In the comments, give me your idea for a way to read binaries, and I'll make a follow-up video generating graphs and analyzing for these different systems to see what kind of numbers could they represent best. And yes, this video did take two more days in the quiet, but I've hit a bit of a snack, got a little bit sick at the worst time possible, and then I had to play Doom Eternal where I donate one dollar charity for each death. Easy to say, it wasn't great for me. But if you'd like to donate some money charity, I'd recommend my daily live streams. So special thanks to Ovo for this absolute banger, and to my patrons for supporting me financially. A special thanks to Acronymous, Useless Quasar, Legbear, and Positron for being highest tier patrons. And I'm off to work on some more videos. Thank you everyone so much for watching. And have a great day. Bye.